Please welcome Larry Maggot, CEO of ConnectSafely.org and panelists for improving your company's privacy posture. Well, thank you very much. So that announcement we just heard, I'm told that was, that's called the voice of God. So it confirmed what I've always known, that God is a woman. So now we know. Um, my name's Larry Maggot, and uh, as mentioned, I'm CEO of ConnectSafely.org, which is a nonprofit uh, safety, internet safety, privacy, and security organization. And if some of you recognize my voice, I'm also the CBS News technology analyst. And if you see me panicking towards the end of the segment or this session, it's because I have my daily live segment on KCBS at 350, where we're going to talk about today, Data Privacy Day, and what we talk about the session. And maybe I'll repeat some of your questions. I don't know. We'll figure that out at 350. But um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, before I introduce the panelists, I'm going to put in a little commercial. This is Data Privacy Day, which is actually one of two important internet safety rel ethics, whatever you want to call it, related days coming up within eight days of each other. Uh, next Tuesday, Tuesday, February 5th, in addition to I just learned being the State of the Union address, is also Safer Internet Day, which my organization coordinates for the U.S. So we're having our big event in Seattle, which will be streamed. We're having an evening event. If anybody here lives in Seattle, uh, you can bring your family to our evening event, and you can DVR the State of the Union. We will not be playing it, um, but um, we, we certainly uh, hope to have people there. But it's a great pleasure to be here, and I am very excited to be moderating this particular panel because I've given a lot of thought to what is the responsibility of different stakeholders when it comes to protecting data. In the previous panel, we heard a lot about government. Clearly, government does have a role, and I suspect it's going to have an increasing role in my organization, Connect Safely, we focus primarily on consumers. So we talk a lot about what people can do to protect themselves, to protect their own data, to protect their security, because there is no such thing as privacy if there's no security. Everything from passwords to being careful what you post on Facebook, et cetera, et cetera. And all of that is important. But I often think of, when I think about both data and security, or privacy and security, I think of the transportation analogy. And many of us drive cars. And when, when we get behind the wheel of our car, we have a fair amount of control over our fate. Not complete. We can be T-boned and something bad can happen to us. It's totally not our fault. But if we're sober and careful and don't text and have our seatbelts and drive a car with airbags, et cetera, we are really doing a lot to increase the probability that we're going to arrive safely. When it comes to both privacy and security, that's sometimes true. Sometimes we are masters of our own domain, like what we post on Facebook and what we choose to use for passwords. But sometimes more like drivers in a car, we're more like passengers in a bus. And we are vulnerable to what the bus company or the bus driver uh, happens to, to do as we sit idly in the bus. Now, in some ways, we could have chosen, I guess we could be very careful what bus we take and maybe inspect the tires before we get on and make sure it's a reputable bus company. But sometimes we don't even have that level of control. Sometimes we are literally victims of companies who, for whom or companies' problems emerge from companies for whom we don't even necessarily have a relationship, like a credit bureau, that we, we have a relationship we didn't choose to. And so it's very difficult me, for consumers to have complete uh, agency when it comes to protecting our privacy, which is why it is so important that folks like Visa and Palo Alto Networks and Verizon and um, all the other players that, that are at this conference do everything they can so that the bus is as safe as it possibly can be. Um, so with that as an introduction, for me, I'm going to turn it over, I guess we'll do John because he's first on the list, John Gevertz, the Vice President of Global Policy of Visa, and followed by Lourdes, Lourdes uh, Terecha? Terecha. Terecha, not bad, the Senior Privacy Counsel for Palo Alto Network. So uh, John, why don't we start with you? Thanks, Larry. Um, Delighted to be here. Uh, I am the Chief Privacy Officer at Visa, where I've been for almost a year and a half. Uh, and my team does the legal aspects of privacy, information governance, and what we call privacy operations. Uh, before coming to Visa, I was um, at ADP for a long time. I'll make a plug because ADP is another company that's been very involved with NCSA over the years. In fact, the uh, the current chair of uh, the NCSA is an old colleague at ADP, or a former colleague, a young person. Um, and in, in, at ADP, I had a succession of, uh, I, am, I am a lawyer, but I had a succession, of, a succession of roles in both legal and security areas. 
Thank you, Larry, and thank you, John. Happy Data Privacy Day, everyone who are here at LinkedIn and joining us live online. I am so thrilled to be here to celebrate Data Privacy Day with you and to help spread awareness about this, one of the most important issues of our time, data privacy. As Larry mentioned, I'm Lourdes Turetsha. I'm Senior Privacy Counsel at Palo Alto Networks, a cybersecurity company whose mission is to protect our way of living in the digital age. And I help support that mission by weaving privacy into our products and daily operations. And prior to joining my current company, I worked as outside counsel with other companies and also as, as an in-house privacy program leader uh, prior to joining Palo Alto Networks, handling privacy and GDPR issues and incident response. I've got some questions that have been shared with the panelists, but I'm going to add a little just slightly. Um, the first one is, what is, businesses, what is the case for businesses for pri privacy and why should companies of all sizes care? And when we say all sizes, I want to start, you know, obviously, very large companies, but also companies that are essentially zero, that, are, that haven't even started yet. And so I think this is a good place to introduce not only why it's important for large companies, but why it's important for startups and perhaps even venture capitalists who are funding startups to be thinking about privacy at the very, very beginning before the product came out. So in other words, when you build a car, you put the brakes in first. You don't wait for the first accident before you add brakes. Sure. Thanks, Larry. I'll get started then. Um, I think, you know, it's a great segue from the last panel where we talked, where, where at the end it was a discussion of the fact that there's just all this data and it's all personal information. So any company, all may be a little bit of an overstatement, but I'll, certainly a lot of it is, a any company that's starting up is going to deal with personal information, whether it's a data-driven business or not. Companies have employees, they have customers, they have suppliers, so they have real pure PI in those cases. They're getting contact information, they get, if it's for the employees they're processing, a ton of very sensitive personal information. And then, of course, as they figure out what their business model is, they are looking at how they are going to collect data, utilize data, share data, destroy data, um, and so forth. So I, I think you know any company, whether it's a mature company or or an idea, has to think about the life cycle of the data that it, it is going to ultimately handle. I I think there's a very strong case, business case for privacy, and and I say this for three reasons. First. Privacy is being demanded by customers, both, both in the B2B and B2C context. Secondly, bad privacy practices tarnish you know, companies' brand reputations, and we see that all over news and in headlines. And, and lastly, privacy violations are very expensive. Now, I want to go back to the f first point about customers demanding privacy. We see that both in the B2B context, when deals are getting negotiated and certain companies can't uh, agree to certain privacy obligations because they haven't simply haven't done the work of building it into uh, their, their product or their business operations. We've also seen some studies, and the numbers aren't quite there yet, in the B2C context where privacy is, is slowly becoming a consideration in, in purchasing decisions. I, I, frankly, I, th I think I saw it was 35%. Uh, I, I wish it were higher, but it, 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 it is encouraging. And, and lastly, as Larry was uh, suggesting earlier, we've also seen uh, VCs and acquiring companies uh, have or, or include or consider privacy during the valuation period or during due diligence when they're when they're uh, assessing their target companies. If I can challenge you a little bit, quick, just quickly, then I'll, um, I, I absolutely agree with you that customers or consumers should be looking at privacy, but unless it happens to be the subject of a Time magazine cover, as Facebook is this week, or unless it, the company happens to have had a major data breach, which has happened to a number of companies, how do we know? I mean, when I go out and purchase a product, most of the time I really have no idea what practices the companies engage in. I mean, they may, have, they may have a privacy policy, but that doesn't really tell me a lot about their practices. Um, I agree, and, and I, I, I think that's why we have to innovate in this area and not rely on privacy policies and come up with better ways to provide notice and transparency. 
You know, I'm struck by and I'm delighted that the conversation about the business case for privacy has been focusing on the consumer because I think a year ago these conversations would have been focused when we talked about the business case for privacy. We've been talking and sat in so many of those conversations where the business case for privacy was all about compliance and all about the 4% fines po possible under GDPR. And that, you know, that actually helped move the ball in some respects and got a lot of companies thinking about it. But I, I, at the end of the day, what really should be driving privacy and what this conversation is illuminating is, is the clients and the consumers and the people whose data that we process. And if the laws are doing it right, and if the companies are doing it right, it's figuring out how to be transparent about the collection, process, collection and use processes about that data in a way that enables consumers to make, cho to make choices. And, that gets, and that's really hard. It's not as easy as writing, you know, a privacy notice when you're collecting all sorts of information through sensors and other IoT devices. The, the, the consent model that we've grown up with is, is, is gotten much more complicated. But I think it's good that we're talking about that and we're not simply talking about the enforcement actions and 4% and, and, and fines or what kind of actions we're going to see under you know, not that they're not important conversations, but what type of action we're going to see under the myri under the CCPA and the myriad of other laws that we're now um, seeing in state legislatures or possibly at the federal level. You know, and it gets even more complicated. If I think about my connected home and now my connected car, there are so many devices from so many companies, you know, coming from so many countries that are connected to my home router and that are or my cars, whatever it's got in it, it's got some kind of a router modem, I don't know. But the point is that, that it's very difficult. And many of these don't even have a user interface. I mean, my, my door lock doesn't have a screen or, or a pad on it. It's just this thing that opens and closes based on codes that are sent to it from an app that I have absolutely no idea how it works. And I'm actually fairly tech savvy and have no idea how it works. And so I think that we're in a point now where there has to be trust. And does that trust because you know, we could always deal with big brands. I mean, we, we know and trust Visa and Palo Alto Networks where they're big companies and very credible, but sometimes you want to buy something from a startup because it's got a really cool product and you want to support these two guys in a garage or wherever they, or two gals in a basement or wherever they are. And so, again, it, it's very difficult for consumers to have a, a sense as to whether they're getting the privacy they deserve. I'm not sure that was a question or a statement, but you're more than welcome to respond to it. I certainly agree, and it, it's something that we discussed offline uh, or before this panel is that, you know, when is the right time to think about privacy? And and I think we all agree that we do it from the very beginning. If you're you're a data-driven company, then from the idea stage before you build your product, uh, you should be thinking about these privacy questions, these features, and 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 instead of as a thinking of it as a roadblock or a privacy or a legal checkbox, I would challenge uh, everyone, especially those in the design and engineering and product um, industries, to think about it as a challenge to innovate, to do better in this in this area. And one more comment before my last question. is I had lunch the other day in a no-name diner operated by a small family, and I was, despite the fact the government was closed at the time, I was actually pretty happy that there are federal inspectors that go around looking at food so that even this company that I had no basis to trust, at least presuming they were operating within the law, I had some basis to understand that they were using reasonable practices because we have national standards as to how food should be handled. I don't think we have national standards as to how data should be handled. So, and I know that was more or less the last comment. So the next question is, with so many changes in the privacy ecosystem, how can companies not only comply, but break through as leaders in privacy, and what are the key factors that make them successful? Take a stab at that. I, I, first of all, it's maturing your own program. I mean, you, you, you're not going to strike out as a leader if you don't have the right program in place, and that's, you know, whether you do, and we, we've been talking about building privacy into the, into the data life cycle. I'm not sure we use the term privacy by design yet in this panel, but that's what it is, thinking about what you're doing with data from the first time you're collecting it to, to how you're designing a, pro, a product to the user um, interface so that 
your, your, what data you're collecting and how you're using it is made as transparent as you possibly can, notwithstanding, Larry, the challenges that you talked about, about how, how sensors give you, give you notices and, and so forth. And it's, it's also having the right process for doing um, essentially privacy risk assessments. We call them PIAs generally. It's, it's, it's how you do privacy impact assessments. But it's actually ha having them mean something and having a right process so that you're able to demonstrate some maturity um, with respect to the evaluation of privacy risks or, or the risk involving personal information as you collect it, store, use it, store it, et, et cetera. And I think, you know, I, I think Kalinda made a, an excellent point before, that privacy is really cultural. And so for a company to be a leader is you have to have that cultural tone. It's not simply having some lawyers thinking about checkbox privacy and looking at what the law says and doing what you have to. It's building it into the design. It's making sure that all of your employees know privacy enough to spot issues, to raise issues, whether it's a privacy issue or fundamentally whether it's a security issue. Because all of these nice things that we're doing about privacy are really important, but one, at its core, one of the things that we want to make sure we're not doing is exposing data and losing data. Um, and I, I, I think, so it's, it's all the employees and it's setting the right tone for the top. The leadership has to think that privacy is important and there's no, um, there's no substitute for having that kind of, of effective um, tone from the top in, in, in any organization, whether it, it's a large organization or a startup where the, where the top and the bottom may be closely related. Uh. I agree with everything John just uh, mentioned. You know, there are a lot of ways that you can do to improve your company's privacy posture, privacy by design, privacy reviews. Uh, at the end of the day, I think there are really two uh, high-level factors that help determine whether or not your your company is successful. And, and John mentioned one of them. Uh, we both agree that culture and leadership buy-in is important. I've seen it play out both ways where, without naming names, you know, company A privacy team comes in and they spend most of their time, uh, instead of doing work, uh, evangelizing and trying to convince leadership that what they were brought in to do is worth uh, funding or staffing and, 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 and supporting. I've also seen it play out where uh, on the opposite end, the privacy team comes in and, in, and instead of uh, having to uh, direct their efforts towards convincing leadership that this program should be done, that we need to build our GDPR compliance program. Uh, that initiative was already de there straight from the top, not just from the C level, but also from the board level. And that makes it very easy to set that tone within the company, that culture of privacy, uh, because then you get to do the daily nitty gritty work of building privacy into your company. If I may add, you know, I focused a little bit on the internal aspects of building a privacy program, and the question was also about leadership in general. So let's talk about, you know, the the external aspects. To be a privacy leader, you also need, I think what I referred to before is table stakes and having that maturity of your program. But to be a leader, I, you have to be out there talking to your clients, whether they're, whether they're other companies in a B2B model or whether they're consumers in a B2C model or both, most likely both. You need, to, you need to hear what they care about, what they're thinking about, how they care about what you're doing or what might, might do with information pertaining to them, and to regulators and industry groups. What are they thinking about? As we talk about the possibility of federal legislation, how do we get involved, and the, the last panel really articulated this at length, but how do you get involved in those discussions? And I think leadership is being involved and not just waiting for things to happen. I have a question for everybody in the room. How many people here have ever watched the episodes of Mad Men, TV show Mad Men? So I happen to be old enough to have lived through the period, or much of the period that that show took place, and I remember watching an episode where people are having a picnic and they just threw their trash on the ground and walked away. I remember watching episodes where people would be sitting around smoking in the office or drinking heavily in the office. Uh, I remember episodes where all of the executives were men and women were only secretaries and later on we saw women executives. And my point is that having been on this planet for now more years than I care to admit, I have seen enormous cultural changes, right? And I mean, 
you name it, it's misogyny, racism, homophobia, a lot of things that we, at least to some extent, have started overcoming. So when you guys talk about cultural shifts, I think about both how far we've come, which is the good news, and how long it took, which is the bad news, for some major cultural shifts. And I guess what I'm asking is, how do those same kinds of cultural shifts apply towards privacy, security, and uh, you know, good practices when it comes to being custodians of people's data? Getting blank stares. I mean, because you kind of touched on it. You know. I mean, you're asking if we've known. Yes, there are those cultural cultural shifts. We, we've certainly seen them. I think GDPR was one such shift. We we I agree with what Kalinda said earlier. I actually like that GDPR. You know, I think GDPR is a good thing. I think it's brought about a lot of change changes uh, from companies because they were uh, made to pay attention. And so uh, there are others. Uh, there are certain big da data incidents and data breaches or, or those waves of data incidents and, and breaches that, that, that we've seen in recent years that uh, is also one of those uh, triggers of, of those shifts. Yeah. I think the blank stare was a little bit of recognition <laughs> of the fact that it's a really hard question because I'm I've been old enough too to have started practicing law before there was an, you know, before there was really an internet. And now we're dealing right with an internet of things and we're dealing with all these challenges. And as we talk about how we confront that as in a cultural area and in the legal area, however we're confronting it, it's hard to, to develop the mechanisms that get us ready for the stuff that we don't know, that's developing now and we don't know what it's going to look like in five years. So how do we build programs? And I think that, you know some of the principle-based things that we've been talking about, about building privacy by design and, 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 and setting the right culture around data awareness and so forth are critical. Beyond that, I wish I had some more answers for you. I must say, though, in, in many of the instances that I was talking about, legal action did play a role. One of the reasons why smoking is down is because it's no longer allowed, you're no longer allowed to smoke in most buildings. So you can still smoke, but it, it, we, the government and its companies have made it so inconvenient that fewer people are doing it. And one of the reasons why traffic deaths are down is because you were required to wear a seatbelt. So there is, there, again, government has had a major impact on some of these cultural shifts. I, th I think in, in, in the area that we're dealing with, though, it's hard because I think government lags, but regulation often lags well behind technology. Exactly. And so it was a long time before we realized how dangerous smoke, I mean, after we realized how dangerous smoking is before we started seeing those kind of regulations. Right. Long time after we realized that, you know, seatbelts would be safe before we mandated seatbelts. So I, th I think that's a challenge. I think it's one we have to address but it won't be easy from a regulatory standpoint. So next question on my list is, what are some of the unique approaches that companies might not often think of when improving their privacy posture? I can start. I mean, one of the things is, where do you situate privacy in an organization? How do you do privacy? An awful lot of organizations put privacy within within a legal function. A lot of us are lawyers, but not all of us. Um, but it, it, because it is cultural, I think one of the important things is figuring out where it's going to be most effective in the organization. Does privacy belong in, in, in legal? Does it belong in risk? Does it belong with security? Does it belong with technology? And, and, you know, I think that depends in large part on the nature of the company because we are talking about driving cultural. And the answer is, in some respects is all of them. How do you have your, how do you, how do you support privacy in all of those areas? And then also in a way that those areas are talking to each other because there are some examples of companies where you've got privacy engineers not talking to lawyers, not talking to people that are doing risk assessments and so forth. What do you do if the CEO is only paying lip service to it but not truly buying into it and providing leadership? If you're in your, your I'm not suggesting that's true in your company, but if you had your seat in a company where that were the reality. I would say if that was the case and you were charged with being the CPO of that company, you get in the face of that CEO. Um, because I don't know another way to do it, is, is to, um, I, I've been fortunate in the companies that I've worked at, 
Um, and, and I think Kalinda talked about how, it's, how, how the business has evolved so much during the time period that a number of us have been doing privacy. I don't think that was always the case. I think we're in an environment now, and whether it's a Time Magazine cover story or, or, or huge fines coming out of, uh, out of Europe or whatever it is, where boards and CEOs are paying more and more, t more attention. I think one of the unique approaches that we could take is by diversifying our privacy toolbox and by, what I mean by this is for instance, we can, we can use more carrots instead of sticks, instead of uh, bringing up GDPR 4% fines and, and as entertaining as, as it is to see the blood drain from our executives' faces when they hear about it, it's just not a tenable point to make over and over again, it, it gets old. Uh, instead, you know, we could be more creative about it. We could align the privacy interest with the business interest. We could fix a business pain for, for the business. An example that comes to mind uh, for me is, for instance, the product team uh, struggling with uh, hundreds of GDPR and privacy-related requests or questions from customers that they get about the products and you can certainly as, as the privacy person partner with the team and, and uh, come up for instance with a privacy product data sheet that explains how your products collects, handles, stores, shares personal data. Um, another thing that I glossed upon earlier is to pose it as a challenge to your product teams. You know, this is, this is a problem. There is a challenge here. We don't have all the answers as the lawyers. That's why we have to work together to come up and innovate in this area and come up with new features that uh, are both efficient and are also transparent at the same time. So my final question before we open it up for uh, cust you know, audience interaction, and maybe we can keep our answers brief so we do have some more time is what are some of the unique approaches companies might not, oh, sorry, I'm re reading the wrong script here. What resources are available to help companies find the right approach for their organization? Again, I'll talk about sort of the, the evolution of the, the privacy landscape in, in the time that I've been doing it. When I started uh, doing this, I think the IAPP, you know, the International Association of Privacy Professionals, could have its meeting in two hotel rooms. Um, and you sort of knew everybody that was in one of those rooms. And I think, if, uh, if I remember correctly, the, the current membership list of IAPP is something like 30,000 members globally. And it, it's truly become a global organization. And, I'm, and this is not a, a pitch for IAPP, but there are, there are that many people, there are so many more people that are doing privacy. Um, and there are resources on places like IAPP, on other organizations that you don't have to be a member of to see their resources, like the Future for Privacy Forum, like NCSA, like any number of other organizations. And the other thing, I, you can probably tell, I, if you haven't noticed, is there's a lot of the privacy people like to talk. Um, and happy to have you know conversations and talk about the issues that are so important uh, that we're that we're all facing. I think in many ways collectively these are hard challenges. I agree with all those resources that John shared. IPP uh, Future of Privacy Forum has great resources on different topics. And we could also use the regulators' websites and guidance. They, they have a ton of resources to help uh, not just big businesses, but small businesses on, on privacy and consumer privacy issues. But I think the most important uh, resource that I've found helpful uh, personally in my work has been just the, my colleagues who are similarly situated or in companies in technology uh, who are facing the same challenges as, as we do. Um, we have an informal group here and some of them are in this room, so shout out to them. And, and we meet quarterly and talk about how uh, issues like the CCPA or just all sorts of, of different challenges are, are being dealt with within our res respective companies. Great, thank you very much. And now I'd like to open it up to a lot of smart people in the room for comments or questions. So, yes, sir. Hi, my name is Jim Van Dyke. I'm a researcher in consumer security and fraud. Uh, I'll ask a question and give you a quick background as to why I'm asking it, if that's okay. Uh, the question is, what do you think at the stage that we're at with regard to 
educating identity holders and most effectively empowering them uh, to, to stop data compromise and stop the crimes that result from compromise, what, how good of a job are we doing at that empowerment and education and what do we most need to do to change it? And I'll just give you a quick background that might help you respond to it. The, um, if you look at the big credit reporting agency breach that happened, the newly hired CISO publicly said, well, everybody's data is already out there, which if that were true, then, might have, then there's no reason for anybody to ever hack another system. And it's horribly undermining in terms of motivation. Or there was a big card breach not too long ago from a, from a very large merchant, and the merchant gave everybody credit monitoring after a classic card breach, which is kind of like using a screwdriver to pound in a nail or something ridiculous like that. So my question is, you know, how good of a job do you think we're doing at education and empowerment, and what do you think is most important to take us to the next level of effectiveness with, with that identity holder the, involved? Educating the industry or educating the no, consumer? No, with, with partnering directly with the identity holder themselves who we're, stopping, we're trying to stop the compromise and fraud with. I think it's a great question because I think there's obviously, you know, need for education. I think, t to your point, the, the, the rote response for compromise events has been credit monitoring. Credit monitoring isn't available in a lot of the world, and it's got limited value in, in, in the states. But, you know, if you have a breach, you, you provide credit monitoring, depending on the nature of the breach, and, depend, and then you, you expend it to, for one, two years, depending on the regulator. I mean, we've, we've seen this. We would, Glenda was talking about, you know, the number, or, or Karen, we're both talking about, you know, the number of breach notification requirements in different states in the U.S. And we, we have those requirements, but um, are we fully empowering people? I, I think that's a really good question because I think at the end of the day, people, there, there aren't magic bullets. You have to pay attention to your accounts to wherever that your, that information can be used, and I don't know a better way to do it. I don't, you know, rel than relying on actually paying attention to to those <coughs> to, to the accounts that have financial information or other information that you're worried about, because credit monitoring only goes only goes so far. And but I, I would take strong issue with the comment that it's all out there, so don't we don't need to worry about it? An awful lot of it is out there, and you can find it. But that doesn't mean you don't do everything you possibly can to protect the data that you're holding on behalf of individuals and, and make it really hard for bad actors to, to both obtain it and to utilize it. I certainly agree that we can do more, spread more awareness, and we have a lot of work uh, to do there. The one thing that I have noticed as a consumer myself, though, is that companies have been providing access to to my credit history through their apps, which I think is a good way to spread the awareness over any potential uh, identity theft that that may you know consumers generally don't have access to or have a ha hard time accessing. Now I don't know if many consumers are actually using those resources. Uh, we, we can do a better job of, of making those known and, and more accessible to them, but th that's one area that I've seen improvement in. Questions or comments? No? Well, I, I'm going to follow up on that also. As a customer of yours, certainly a credit card holder, once in a while I'll get a call or an email from my credit card company telling me that something unusual has happened and asking me to verify if it's a legitimate transaction. Is there a way to be better at that as to, you know, to make, to, I mean, I'm sure there's always a way to be better at everything, but, but when I think about checking my own credit cards, I mean, I, practically every transaction I make these days, I rarely use cash, almost every transaction I make involves some kind of electronic transfer, and I could probably spend all day reviewing them. There, there has to be a way to make my life easier when it comes to reviewing how my, my privacy is being affected. Sure. And that takes, sometimes that does take data. And that takes the thoughtful use of data. But obviously, a company like ours spends a ton of time making sure that we are utilize, that we are doing the kind of analysis, the kind of, <clears throat> um, that detects anomalies and detects things that will bring them to your, either directly to you or more likely through um, your issuing bank, in, in right. our case, that, that, that tells you, you know, hey, you couldn't have been in two places at once. Um, or 
you you know and and looks for patterns. looks for looks yeah. for patterns absolutely right. and uh, I think it's the probably one you know one of the very most important things that we do as a company is spending a lot of time getting better and better at, at that kind of fraud prevention and that kind of identity protection. Gentleman right here, we almost out of time, but go ahead. Hi, uh, this specific to uh, Visa and also for Mastercard. I used to subscribe uh, data from those people for verifications. I do recognize they do store some biometric data of myself. And one of the data they store is my shoe size as a verification. So there's a debate before is shoe size is opposed to the data you don't want your, your credit verification company on or not. Shoe size? Yeah. They use as a parameter for verify your purchase things. Wow. Yeah. And they read it out, they go, okay, I know my shoe size. That means if I know your shoe size, I can steal your identity? <laughs> uh, no, they basically is non-zero number. You put a negative number, that the equations just blow up. Wow. We tried it already. But they, they do know what you purchase and what certain biometric data. I'm not, quite frankly, not aware of the, the shoe size um, and, and, and collecting that information. Perhaps one of the apps that you, you utilize would do something like that. But I'm not, a, I'm not aware of our doing that. Not you, the other people. Okay, well, thank you very much. Oh, one, I'm sorry, so very I'm quickly, sorry. yes. Well, I don't know if this is a quick question, but and following up on, on this gentleman's question and Larry on yours, I'm wondering if, we're, if there's any debate around whether we're going at this the right way. And by that, I mean, has there been any discussion about creating sort of a privacy bill of rights that identified the elements of your, per, of your person that should be um, able to be kept private at your discretion? And then I guess the follow-on question to that is, is then, is there a technology solution eventually that we could build around that, for instance, you know, through a blockchain technology or something like that that would allow the keys to privacy to be put into the hands of the, of the consumer so they could turn, off, turn on and turn off uh, those elements at their and, choosing? And fundamental is, is who, who really owns and, and has that control of the data, you or the company or a collector of it? And I think it's an important question. And I know there's been a lot of discussion about that, especially among the blockchain folks. Quickly, we, we're out of time, but let's have a quick, or not, almost out of time. It's a great question that yeah. we've been discussing and debating for years. And I don't, you know, to, to the Bill of Rights, we've had that conversation for years about what privacy should cover. Um, to the technolo technological solution, I, I'm, and I would love to see that someday, but I haven't, you know, blockchain is certainly one of those things that have been put forward as a possible uh, piece, uh, uh, solution to tracking data and, and safeguarding privacy, but there are also issues about maybe exposing privacy. Um, so I am excited to track the area, but I'm not aware of any, any such um, solution at this time. Yeah, I, it would be great to have it, and I look forward to having it. But, but I don't know yeah, what the it only is. thing I would add is that if you make it too complicated, like PGP, it's not going to happen. So you got to make it so it's really simple. Thank you very much. I appreciate everybody being here. I appreciate the panel. Thank you. Yeah.